for one singular reason. No economy has ever printed $6.72 trillion in 30 months. That's basically turning on the printing presses, printing money, giving it away for free, dreaming up other reasons to give more money away for free, such as student loan forgiveness, and then the Anti-Inflation Act, that's just hilarious to call it that. And uh, as a result, we got a really perplexing, difficult time for investors. In today's video, Canadian businessman and entrepreneur Shark Tank star, known as Mr. Wonderful Kevin O'Leary, updates about the crypto market, his take on Bitcoin and where we are headed next in the crypto space. He also speaks about his thoughts on stablecoins, and why regulation is very important for the cryptocurrency industry to thrive in these volatile times, and urges investors to protect their assets moving forward while the suffering unfolds. Please let us hear your opinions in the comments section. The US consumer is quite healthy. Thoughts on this? I mean, surprised? No, I'm not. I also have the benefit of tear sheets from 56 private companies. We've seen no slowdown yet. A highly unusual situation going on here, given uh, how much the market is corrected, anticipating slowdown in earnings and a recession and a Fed gone wild with another 75 and potentially another 75 after that. None of these rate hikes have affected the consumer yet. And I speculate it's for one singular reason. No economy has ever printed $6.72 trillion in 30 months. It's basically turning on the printing presses, printing money, giving it away for free, dreaming up other reasons to give more money away for free, such as student loan forgiveness, and then the Anti-Inflation Act, that's just hilarious to call it that. Uh, it's very inflationary. And so at some point, we'll have to stop printing money, but it hasn't happened yet. All-time record deficit, um, consumers flush with cash, and these earnings are proving it out this week. If we're going to get a slowdown in earnings, it's probably going to be in Q1 or 2 next year because it doesn't look like it's going to make it this quarter. And uh, as a result, we've got a really perplexing, difficult time for investors. It, it, it is a perplexing time. And you say, you know, higher rates aren't affecting the consumer yet. But what about inflation fears? I mean, hotter numbers just keep rolling in here. When does that hit the system? Well, the inflation fears come from the CPI number. Uh, which was over 8%, and that is inflationary. However, there's a new narrative going on in the market with investors regarding how the CPI is constructed. 40% is in shelter, and shelter stats are notoriously long dated. In other words, the numbers you're seeing now reflect the, the shelter market, the housing market, the apartment rental market 18 months ago when it was smoking hot. That is not the case in major cities now. Rent increases have slowed down, housing prices have softened as mortgages have increased, and yet it's not reflected yet. So it's a little bit of saying, I wanna change the data set now because I don't believe it anymore. That's kind of one narrative. But even though it's sitting at over 8%, the market is willing to fribulate, waiting for more earnings um, validation that we actually have a slowdown. It's simply not there yet. And so if the Fed keeps using this 8% number and keeps ratcheting rates, they will overshoot. Because everything is packed, I'm sure you would agree from, from your travels. Um, so then, does a rude and cold awakening affect us overnight? Is it just gonna hit us like a wall at one point? Like boom, recession. I don't think so. Um, I, I agree with you. I have another index, Las Vegas, which I've never seen it fuller than it was last week at the Web3 conference. You couldn't walk in the aisles. It was so jam-packed. Casinos jam-packed, restaurants jam-packed, traffic jam-packed. So that, that pent-up demand is certainly there. Recessions start traditionally with a rise in unemployment. Haven't seen that yet either. If you're in the food services industries on either coast, where in California, for example, the minimum wage is $15. You can't even hire people for $23 an hour now. They don't even want to work. So that, that cash that's flushing around the system is still having an effect there. It's not clear how the, you know, the poo-poo hits the fan on this one yet, but the market has made a decision. The corrections in the S&P 500 have been brutal and fast in every single sector. And so the market, generally speaking, is never wrong forever. And what it anticipates is a sharp decline in earnings, because right now the PE, if we believe the earnings for next year, is sitting between 14.5 and 15 percent. 
Well, that's getting close to a bottom. I mean, you could argue the bottom would be 12x, which is really, really low earnings to the S&P. But here we are at 15. I mean, I'd argue it's time to start nibbling. You can't guess the bottom, but my goodness, just on a strong index basis, you could go into this market saying to yourself, regardless what the correction is, two thirds of it's baked in. Well, then, you know, I, if, from what I'm hearing from you, are you somewhere to, in the middle of, you know, Jamie Dimon, who's saying the recession coming six to eight months, brace for economic hurricane, and, and President Joe Biden on the other side of the spectrum saying uh, recession unlikely, and if one does hit, it will be for a short term. Are you somewhere in between there? Well, Biden has to talk his book because he's only weeks away from a midterm where he's threatened right now to lose the House. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the Senate. What they wanted to have happen was that there's some indication of a slowdown in inflation. They didn't get that. And their gas prices in some states are on the rise. That's never, ever good for the incumbent, regardless of what party they're in. Inflation really kills you at midterms, and that's what they've got. So also, if the Fed raises another 75 basis points before, which they will do before the midterms, that's not helpful either. So it's a really difficult act that he has to a higher wire act he's got to do. Biden's got to talk his book and try and keep as many of his candidates in the, in the game as they can. Um, you know, when we talk about politics, abortion was the issue, uh, and that seems to have been shifting now in the last few weeks to inflation and the cost of protein like chicken and food goods and gasoline back in the fray again. So, you know, these things are binary. They're very difficult to call, but it does matter to you as an investor what happens in the midterms. There's no question about that. All, all of us buy services that are investing to get this data every day. They're about six seats ahead. I'm, I've learned in the past that means nothing. There's no guarantees on anything. But right now that would be the House. You can't call the Senate. So let's say the House flipped. The good news on that is all new bills, all new initiatives that are not bipartisan bills, in other words, ram a jam -a down your throat bills like the student debt thing, a uh, ramajama bill like uh, anti-inflation bill. I mean, nobody wanted to vote for that on the other side of the aisle. So those kinds of bills are dead for the rest of this presidency. There'll be total, total gridlock. And that is a good thing. Uh, the markets love gridlock. Markets like a pause that refreshes. We need a pause. The printing presses have gone insane, and that's why we have inflation in the first place. I mean, for all the talk about inflation, you print $6.72 trillion in 30 months. What, what the hell did you think was going to happen? <laughs> of course there's going to be inflation. It's a uh, difficult challenge for Biden. I don't think anybody's going to give him A-plus for foreign affairs at this point. Been a lot of mixed signals. We started with the Green Initiative in the U.S. Uh, we gave up our oil independence that blew up in everybody's face in the form of high gasoline prices. Now he's talking to uh, dictators in Venezuela flying over to see the Saudis, asking them not to stop production. They don't care, it's obvious. Um, that's not great, but at the same time, it does make us do a little soul searching in the US about getting back to energy independence, and there's a lot of pressure on that, given what's going on in Germany. So all of this ends up being a market consideration. Right now, oil is being capped in price by those bears that are concerned about a global recession and use of, of energy. But not every country is buoyant with the consumer as the U.S. is because U.S. dollars cause lots of headaches in other currencies. You know, when you look at the value of currencies in, in other nations against the U.S., it's getting very, very tough for them. And so there's a lot of cross currents here. But right now, people are focused on the Fed. They're focused on the midterms. And all of this is going to play out in the next five weeks. So stay tuned. It's going to get really interesting. Are you watching what's happening over in the UK? Oh, I, I, I love the British parliamentary system. I'm very <laughs> familiar with how it works. And in fact, there's lots of precedent for, precedent for prime ministers that come in, make a fatal mistake right out of the gate, as she did on this corporate tax thing and personal tax thing, and then get whacked immediately. They lose the support of their caucus. In the parliamentary system, the only way you become the prime minister, that's like the queen bee, you're elevated to that position for one reason, so that you can fill out your caucus, your cabinet. You choose the cabinet members, They're, you're the orchestra leader, but if you choose cabinet members like finance or exchequer and all of these other important positions in the British system, and they don't like you, they turn on you like a rabid dog and they throw you out with a confidence vote. That happens all the time. Now, what's, what's holding this one back is they're not sure they'd win a general election given all the 
you know, snafus they've had. But I, I, I love Downing Street. I love the chaos in parliamentary systems. I really enjoy it. And it's, the, the outcome's unknown, but obviously but she backpedaled. And um, it, it has brought a little stability to the credit markets in the UK. But this is the kind of thing, people think uh, politicians are infallible. They're not, they make lots of mistakes. And there's a good example of how that happened. European banks are zombie banks. Their return on assets is abysmal. They never went through the cleansing that the giant crisis in the US occurred in 2008, 2009 where we, we bailed out our banks, but we also put these really difficult, difficult covenants on them, the use of leverage and credit ratios and all the rest of it. So they ended up being much stronger when they were refounded. That's not the case. Bank of Scotland is still owned by the, by the government, which is horrific. You never want a government running a bank. Uh, all the rest of the banks in, in, the, um, in, in Europe are uninvestable. They are absolute zombie banks, abysmal investments, I mean, avoid with extreme prejudice, absolute, make no money, terrible returns on assets, fat, really bad margins, everything bad you could say about them, you can say about them, then you should double it. They are just zombies. Top stock pick, should there be an economic downturn? I mean, your thoughts, what are you doing You know, with stocks like Apple, Tesla, Netflix, the big guys here? Actually, their earnings were pretty good. People are concerned about what happens. The, the, the challenge with Apple now, it's trading at a really high premium to the market PE, is that the narrative is slowly switching to consumer electronics. You gotta remember, Apple was a tech company, but that's not the case now. So many people are focusing on the manufacturing of iPhones being the only thing the company does, which isn't true. But when a narrative changes on a stock, it can compress PE. So when it broke 150, we lightened up on it. We still own some. I don't like the chart, I don't like the story, I don't like the narrative, and I am worried about what happens if these really expensive iPhones, if there is a slowdown at the consumer level in Q2 next year or Q1 even that early, if that doesn't take that stock well below 120. Because it really, if you believed it was gonna trade at a market multiple, you'd be at like 105 right now. And so I don't think it's a safe place to park money. I, I think you know it's, it should be weighted under a full weighting. For me, 5%, so I've got this thing sitting at around 2% weighting, uh, willing to buy more, but I, I think the, the next direction for Apple is down. Anything safe for you these days? What is safe? I don't see anywhere you can be safe uh, right now. You, you have to kind of tread water. Uh, I continue to add in two areas, really high quality US S&P 500 companies, of which I buy 100 of the 500 in an index from Alps called OUSA. It's an ETF, anybody can buy it. I'm not recommending it, I'm just saying what I use. And then I use another Alps ETF called OUSM, and that is 200 names in the Russell 2000. So a fraction of the Russell 2000, the companies that make money. My whole thing now is, while I'm waiting in the weeds, is I'm willing to buy companies that are profitable, have high return on assets, and do cash distributions. Everything else I don't want to own, because those are getting absolutely crushed, and the bottom is it not in yet. Um, so many companies, when people thought, oh, it can't get any lower, and it goes down another 40, 50 percent. Yeah. What about the U.S. dollar? I think it remains strong at times of uh, uncertainty and war, and uh, we've got two wars going on, the Ukrainian war and the war with, Japan, with uh, China, the economic war, and the threats as we build up more tariffs, we stop selling them chips for AI. Uh, you know, this, at some point, these two sides have to come to the table because there's too much to lose. But there's a war going on there too. Uh, that brings a lot of instability. It certainly crushed the values of Chinese stocks, which are starting to look very interesting. These are companies in some cases growing still at 30% that are trading at almost single digit PEs. Not yet, but getting close. And so uh, when, you know, when you get an Alibaba whacked you know, a huge amount or a 10 cent or any of these names, I always wait for the blood in the streets to buy those things in the first place, and they're starting to look pretty interesting. I mean, there was a huge change in the direction of capital going into crypto in the last six months. So what's changed now is most of the investors that are willing to take the highly speculative investments, and some of them are large, a new deal called Mistin, M-I-S-T-E-N, just got funded. Evan Chung was the name of the fellow who left Facebook. He was doing their digital currency. He took the whole team set up a new company, raised 300 million in 45 minutes, basically without a deck. FTX was the lead investor at 100 million. I put money into that deal. 
Um, he is promising a new blockchain to service financial transactions at 10 times the speed of anything else out there. And we do need that, so there's a lot of interest. But there's an example of a have company that really has no revenue, it's just starting its, its journey with now 300 million. It was almost 6x oversubscribed. The rest of the crypto market that came out of the DeFi space has been obliterated. And financings there are being done in cram down rounds, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80% less than the last round. Very, very difficult. If the company's not profitable, there's not a lot of investor appetite for it. So you have the haves and the have nots. In addition to that, the whole Web3 movement, which was what that whole conference was about, is more towards mass adoption. Everybody that's investing money into that is trying to solve for the wallet, number one. Number two, security. And number three, regulation. Those are the three horsemen of the new Web3 movement. Mass adoption through regulation, through security, and a much easier to use wallet. The best analogy I can give you, until your grandmother can figure out how to buy Bitcoin on her, on her cell phone, we don't have a wallet that works yet. It has to pass the grandmother test. The grandma test. Um, just final thoughts uh, on Bitcoin as it's slowly crawling, trying to get back up here. Are you adding to your Bitcoin position still? Well, I'm doing what a lot of other traders are doing. I'm going into the November time period with over 34 different positions on, many of them underwater. So naturally what I'm going to do now that the IRS and other regulators around the world are now looking at crypto in terms of tax compensation, very much like a security, I'm going to have to trade. So I'm going to be doing trading, taking some of the projects that have been decimated down 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent, selling those and basically buying what I consider the granddaddy index of all crypto, Bitcoin. So I can go through the tax season owning more Bitcoin, I will, maybe a little bit more Ethereum, but basically the large market cap names are the ones that matter. So if you're going to do a basket of names to hold through the back end of the year, I would say it's going to be Bitcoin, Ethereum, Polygon, Solana, um, you know, those are, are huge market cap names uh, and, and, I, and I think are going to index together. I don't think any one of those breaks out of the pack. They all kind of trade in tandem. So if you're only going to own one, it's probably going to be Bitcoin, but all the rest trade in tandem with Bitcoin anyways.